What's up, guys? It is Friday, and it is all tied up with your host, me, Chris Marler, and my good buddy, Clint Lamb. Clint, how the hell are you, man? I'm doing good, brother. How are you doing today? I'm good. I got a new shirt. It's not the Cover Crimson shirt, though, so it's not as cool. You guys haven't sent me one. Did you sign up for the annual? Probably. No, I'm just kidding. Clint, you didn't have it. Behind the uh, curtain here, my life is spiraling in terms of trying to stand. I need to get a, a notebook or a calendar or both. Everyone um, I know who covers college football, their head is currently spinning. Unless it's like already happened, like Florida State people I know, they're kind of getting into the groove of things. Last week was their head yeah. week, but man, uh, it's been it's already been a crazy crazy week. Um, I thought I had everything, all my boxes checked. I realized I didn't have a an arm or anything for my mic, so we're just gonna hold it. I see. So, yeah, I noticed that. That's nice. Yeah, it uh I, I mean I thought I was I got the camera, I got the tripod, I got the laptop, everything I needed. Uh the Go XLR mic. I'm like, oh I'm doing good, man. I ain't gotta go get nothing. Yeah. And then I realized I didn't have an arm and I'm like, ah. and I was gonna rig something, but I was just like, I'll hold it for this episode. I don't know, man. It I'm right there with you is what I'm saying. It's been a I long week. Um, yeah, I thought you were going to sing me a song at first. But um, listen, we don't want to get the audience waiting for us. We're not going to talk about any sort of pizza rolls or Hot Pockets or Bagel Bites this time. We're just going to get right into football. And it's a episode we are doing one of my favorite things, one of the things I love to do deep dives on. And I did one late, late, late into the night and early morning last night. And that is Best Bets and pick em. Um for the games each and every week, but we're going to start obviously with the slate in week one. There's some really good games from start to finish. I tell you what, the biggest thing that jumps out to me is not a certain game. It's like in a time where it seems like all the decisions being made about college football in general, never have the fans interest in mind. They finally did something right for the fan because we have football from 12 till maybe 1 a.m. of just good, good football all day. In in, In that every year though? no, no, it's not. I feel like a lot of opening days, like, or oh, opening days is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. It yeah. is because, like, a lot of times it'll be like, okay, there's one good game on, and it's either at noon or it's like at eight, and they have like the other remotely good games are on at like 7 45, 8 30. It's like all jammed in there together. But from start to finish, we have some really good marquee games, and we got them really all weekend. Uh, so we're going to get started with our, our best bets, go through some games, and at the end of it, I'm going to tell you some other uh, bets I think you should take a look at just from, you know, some of the, the research I did. Uh, Let's start with the hometown team here, right? Uh, Bama hosting Western Kentucky. It's the first game of the post-Nick Saban era. Um, Bama is a 31.5-point favorite as of right now, and I will make sure we are up to date and have it uh, at my disposal right here. A lot of interesting um, prop bets involved in this one as well, which we'll get into, but right off the bat, the the, the 31.5-point spread, Bama is a 20-point favorite in the first half. And the total is pretty high. Um, obviously, Western Kentucky can throw the ball a little bit. It's uh, it's fifty nine and a half. What are your thoughts when you see the those those three numbers initially? Um, you know, I, I'm not surprised by a lot of it, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, Western what's Western Kentucky's team total? So it's interesting because they have so many different options of what it is. And when you look, hold on, let me try to pull it up real quick. Um, so is it, are they different like uh, plus minuses? It's like, yeah, it's like in tiers. So like a lot of times, like I'm on DraftKings, right? And, and I like that because they give you so many different options of, of different things you can bet on. So for instance, like when you talk about rushing yard props, when I was telling you this off air, like, you know, Justice Haynes has, it starts at like 25 and it goes up to like 100. And then the odds obviously change with that. So their team total is right around, it says, I believe 12 and a half. And you said that was higher? Than you were anticipating? Not real. I mean, I thought I thought between ten and fourteen sounded about right because of just the nature of their offense and and how they at least try to try to score. Um, Bama's is set currently at oh man um, at forty five and a half, and yeah, the number for so it actually has climbed for Western Kentucky. It's at thirteen and a half, which I feel like is I feel like that's fair because it's also a long game. The the greatest back cup backdoor cover in the history of my gambling career was the Lane Kiffin like uh, and Saban meltdown. I think it's like 2016 when it was a 20 and a, 28 and a half point spread. And Bama had like a turnover within the last two minutes from a backup and they ended up scoring and it made it like 38 to 10. It was 
incredible. I think that Western Kentucky certainly can score. Uh, you, so you said it's climbed to 13 and a half. I wouldn't be shocked at all with 14. Uh, I would think I'm predicting with, uh, I think 48, 17 was my final. Yeah. Um, so that would be, you know, 17, obviously that's quite a bit higher and I would be willing to go all the way to 17. 17 yeah. I can see maybe the low twenties if, if some things go wrong for Alabama. Um, but I would say more so in the high teens is where I kind of projected it going in before I saw any, I, I don't really, I don't really ever go and look at those kind of numbers. Maybe I right. should, but, um, I like the fact that you're bringing that to the table because it, it's a very interesting conversation going in. I, I thought, you know, 14 to 17 sounded about right for me. So 13 and a half, I would definitely go over on that. See, here's the thing. And this is, this is one of the things like, I, I feel like I have opened your eyes up like Aladdin style into this whole new world. And, you know, some people call it being a degenerate. I call it being dedicated. Um, but whether you gamble or not, or you're going to bet on any games like that, that's not the main reason I feel like any of this stuff is not only fascinating, but also relevant to what we're talking about. Because like Vegas is the one thing my dad said that was like the only smart thing he ever said in his life was they didn't build all those million and billion dollar hotels out in the middle of the desert from being wrong. And like Vegas is usually pretty spot on with, with the numbers they throw out there. It's not by accident. It's not, you know, just something they just throw out there willy nilly. So when you look at some of the numbers that surround all the betting going into the game, that's why I feel like it is, it is relevant because it's very rare that they, that they are off um, out there in, in the desert. So I agree with you. I, Cause like, here's the main thing. I don't really care if they score over 13 and a half points as, as a Bama fan. Like what I want to see is, what does the first half look like? What does it look like when you have all your starters and like your intentions, um, you know, like I guess playing out on the field, like, like before the backups go in and, and like everything you had in the game plan from the starters that you're going to be counting on for the entire season, right. Or that you at least hope to be counting on for the entire season. The first half line, like I told you is 20 and a half. The total in the first half is 31 and a half. Um, first quarter total Bama is favored by seven and a half. I do kind of like that. Uh, it might be smart to stay away from that a little bit just because of the fact that, you know, with the helmet comp situation, you got a new coach, maybe they start slow, but here's, here's the main thing I'm looking at with this game. All right. And it's not covering the 31 and a half. Cause that's a big number. There's free money out here. I, and I don't care how that sounds. Jalen Milrose like passing touchdown props is one over one and a half. He like two touchdowns. So let me just give you some numbers to, to help you have some confidence in why that is going to be absolutely free money. If you do choose to bet on it, Jalen Milrow had at least two touchdown passes in seven of his last nine games a season ago. Once the, once the calendar turned to October, he was, he was in at least two touchdowns passing in seven of his last nine games. And then you look at this offense, it's Kalen DeBoer's first game in Alabama. I feel like he's not going to try to necessarily run up the score, but he's going to try to make a statement with this offense where you talk about like, you want to make sure that that fan base and, and like the home crowd is like, getting off getting getting this era started in the best way in the most confident way possible right you don't need to put up 60 or 70 points but you want to make sure that offense is everything that it is as advertised and when you look at what he's done in early season games against group of five opponents like when he was at washington michael Penix, they played they played four of them in the past two seasons and in those four games he had 14 touchdowns in, in those non-conference games against group of five teams, he had nine total in season openers over the two years. So I think it's something you're going to see a lot of a lot of big plays and chunk plays on display early. So I like him to go over that immediately. Uh, yeah, I would say so too. Uh, I understand where their logic is. If mm -hmm. Alabama does what it's supposed to do, then it's possible he gets pulled early. And when you look at Ty Simpson, it might be a situation, and I've talked about this already, it might be a situation like 2017 with Tua Tungvalu and Jalen Hurts where right. they're getting uh, Ty Simpson out there earlier than maybe they would a typical quarterback because they want to, to see him get a couple of drives with the first team in case you know uh, Jalen Milrow is kind of a volume runner. He takes yeah. a punishment like Jalen Hurts, so maybe they want to get him out there a little bit earlier, get him some work with the first team in case anything happens at, at any point with uh with the starter but at the same time i could totally see kind of you know with i don't no one's really doubting the offensive line at this point i don't mm -hmm. think i think everybody's pretty encouraged by that i think everybody's kind of encouraged by you know the one two punch at running back uh the question marks for a lot of people is what does the defense look like without nick saban 
right. and you know Jalen Milrow, and can he take that next step? There are a lot of people who who sing his praises, but there's a lot of people who didn't think he was all that great last year, and they've continued to criticize him throughout the offseason. So I could see this kind of being Kalen DeBoer trying to make a statement with you know Jalen Milrow getting his confidence up early in this season yeah. because at a certain point last year the confidence just skyrocketed, and he was a completely different player once he kind of shook you know some of those. Uh, you know, inexperienced type of tendencies and just, mm-hmm. you know, his confidence started getting going. So I could see them really wanting to put an emphasis on getting him some touchdown passes, Great. maybe some explosive plays downfield, also using his legs. Uh, mm-hmm. I could see like a 2-1 split. You know, there were some people doing some bold predictions yesterday over on the message board talking about three touchdowns and, you know, different things. I would say a 2-1 split probably makes the most sense to me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, that's going to put put it on the over. So, yeah, I think that's pretty easy money. And the last thing we'll say about this, just kind of go through the numbers, because um, we are a Bama show. The, the rushing yard total for him is at 38, um, which, you know, that sounds about right. What I was kind of surprised about was Justice Haynes, uh, his number was set at 90. And, and I think do, people do forget in this offense, I mean, the two backs that you've had the last two seasons have averaged 1,100-plus yards rushing and, like, 14 touchdowns, right? Like, they have they have had really good seasons, even though it's a offense that, you know, sometimes throws the ball 40 times a game. That being said, um, I do think you'll see a lot of explosive plays, so I, I, I would lean to that as well. Um, but yeah, that, that's and, and here's the thing: I would rather see more than any of these spreads being covered outside of the Jalen Nora one because I've invested way too much emotionally and financially into that. But what I want to see more than anything, I would love to see the offensive line give up zero sacks, and I would love to see that defensive line and those guys off the edge and some of those new faces at the edge rush positions get about five sacks because there is going to be opportunities to be had for both of those things to happen. So. Um, all right, moving on from the Bama game, let's get started with the first game on Saturday at noon. We got a good one. It's right down the street from me right now in Atlanta, Georgia and Clemson. They're only 80 miles apart. For some reason, they drove further and further away from their campuses um, to play in a neutral site game. Georgia has been a 13 and a half point favorite all summer. Clemson, all summer. yeah, dude, th- then the line came down last night, like at around 9 p.m. It dropped to 12 and it feels like Vegas has been – I can't tell if Vegas is is confident in Clemson or if it's because Georgia is going to be without Trevor Etienne um, and maybe Stelman. another running back as well. And so, like – And London be, as well. Right. So, like, like Branson Robinson, who's a hoss, like, I mean, that kid could be a stud. He's going to probably get the start um, and, and split some carries. So, I think you'll probably be a little more pass-happy in that offense. But here's the thing. I – like – I don't think there's a ton of Dabo fans out there. I also don't think there's a lot of Bama fans that are pulling for Georgia ever. But when you look at just the actual numbers to back this up, Clemson, over the last couple of years, they have fallen off a cliff a little bit, right? Like against ranked opponents, Dabo Sweeney is 3-8 and eight in his last 11 games against top 25 opponents. He's 1-6 and six against, uh, in his last seven games against top 10 opponents. You look at what Georgia's done against ranked teams, they, they get better, right? Like, like Clemson... They're averaging almost 10 points less per game points scored uh, versus ranked opponents in comparison to unranked opponents. Georgia, over the last three years, is 16 and two straight up against ranked opponents. 16 and two. The only two losses are to Alabama, right? They are 13 and five against the spread in those games. And they're averaging, I think, 39 points per game and almost 470 yards of offense in those games. They have been absolutely dominant. The margin of victory against top 25 teams. During those three years, over 23 points. And the thing that's maybe jumps out the most is that 13 and five record against the spread. Not only are they covering the spread, Clint, they're covering it by an additional 19.8 points per game in those 13 wins. It, uh, this game's really interesting to me mm-hmm. because the fact that it did drop, so it's dropped from 13 and a half to 12. Is that correct? It's currently yeah. at 12. Because see, I knew it had dropped. I didn't know it had dropped all the way to twelve. Uh, that's really interesting. I wonder how much of that has to do with the fact that you know Xavier MacLeod, the transfer from South Carolina, defensive lineman Jordan Hall, both those guys being unavailable due to injury. You talk about you know Kirby's been talking about the depth problem this year, uh, and you know on top of the fact that you know the Clemson actually returns four starters on their offensive line, mm-hmm. over seventy percent of their snaps played at that position. And I think they have a combined like over 100 career starts. Uh, right. You combine that with a veteran quarterback, with you know, uh, you know, potentially a good run game. 
Maybe they think with Georgia having some defensive linemen out, mm-hmm. uh, potentially this, the suspensions with Munden and ETN, obviously from a defensive perspective, ETN's offense, but you know, with Munden potentially being out, you're talking about first and second level defenders yeah. potentially missing. That would make sense with that. You're veteran very young line. on the back end, or at least inexperienced on the back very, end. Very, very young. Yeah. So, I mean, I can see why it's dropping right here at the last second because they might know something that we don't officially know yet with those, right. you know, uh, suspensions. Obviously, we already know about the injuries. I still think uh, Clemson's got some problems. Uh, just, I, I need to see their ability to be able to separate uh, right. that receiver. I mean, I understand it's an inexperienced secondary. But they've they've had trouble with that the last couple of years, and if they yeah. can't do that, they can't get their passing game going. I understand Georgia's having to work into its depth already up front, but I still think defensively they're too good, uh, you know, to be able to get gashed uh, by any you know one team. And I think their offense is going to be able to score some points. So uh, with it being dropping a twelve, typically that's not a good sign. If you're wanting to go the other direction on it, uh, right here at the last second, seeing it move, it means you know Vegas and the people in the know kind of probably know something you don't so i had georgia picked now i'm kind of debating it uh i don't know chris i'll let you go first and let me think about it a little bit well since the time that we've started the show it's dropped again to 11 and a half oh that's not good which is just uh, it, it's insane so the two things i always keep up with, with this and again it's it doesn't mean who's going to necessarily win the game it's just fascinating because they are right way more often than they are wrong if you look at some of the things like on action network they, they do a good job of this kind of compiling all the numbers from like the, the the total money placed on each team. So like the total number of bets versus the total number of money being placed. So a lot of times you'll see a team that's like, oh, like this, I think Ohio this week is playing Syracuse. They have 65% of the bets on Ohio. 78% of the money is on Syracuse, which tells you all the sharp money's there. That hasn't been the case with Clemson necessarily. I think it's almost more of a, like a fret type situation because they are a top 15 team. They are a, a, a team that has a head coach that's won multiple national titles, just like Kirby. But here's the thing I keep coming back to. I love what you brought up about the offensive line because I Clemson's offensive line has been one of the most poorly developed and poorly recruited units for a contending, an elite level contending team over the last decade. And, and if you if that sounds crazy to you, I understand why, but just hear me out. You tell me. Name a five-star recruit on the offensive line that went to Clemson besides Mitch Hyatt. And now tell me a five-star recruit on the offensive line that developed and was a first-round pick because they haven't had one. They've only had one offensive lineman in the last decade or like 11 or 12 years that has been drafted in the first two days in the NFL that draft. That is insane. That's Jackson like, Carmen. It's, it's, un, it's unbelievable. But the thing that I do have at least a little bit more encouraging – um belief in is that Matt Luke has now been hired as the offensive line coach. And I think Matt Luke is a great offensive line coach. Um, first off, I love Matt Luke. You talk about Matt Luke, former head coach, Ole Miss football. Love Matt Luke. So I think he is going to be a difference maker there. He was a guy that was at Georgia before. But I just don't see how for 60 minutes they're able to, like you said, get separation on the outside. I don't think they're going to be able to run to the teeth of that defense. And the thing I keep going back to, man, I don't care what the line is. There's not a better motivator in the country, especially now that Saban's gone, than Kirby Smart. And I heard a stat today from our buddy Chris Phillips at SEC Unfiltered, and it said, since 2021, that Georgia has played 10 games where they've had seven or more days to prepare. They are 10-0 and in those 10 games, and they won seven of them by 20 points or more. That is an insane stat. And, and I, would, I can't remember a time, and I'm sure I'm probably wrong on this, but, you know, Alabama used to play in a lot of these big openers. Yeah. Uh, neutral site, kind of, you know, hyped up. Um, I can't remember a time where right before the game, the the number really started dropping as far yeah. as, you know, because this is right in line. Like, you would think what they're treating Georgia, rightfully so, uh, to their credit, like the old Alabama, which is they're playing yeah. a, to- uh, uh, another top 10 team, and they're almost a two-touchdown favorite, or they were. Uh, and you know, that just, that's pretty absurd when you think about it, but that's exactly what happened with, you know, Nick Saban and Alabama. Mm-hmm. So I just don't remember a time where that number really started dropping significantly. And I'm sure there might be a time I'm missing. Maybe some news came out about a guy. Um, but you know, that that's, that's pretty alarming to me. Uh, yeah. especially, I mean, cause you're talking within the last, so within the last probably what 15, 16 hours has dropped 
Two points. Two full. points. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. Um, and typically when that happens, I, I will normally rob that. Uh, and and here's the thing: just because it dips doesn't mean Vegas or anybody else, any of these you know major betters, thinks that Clemson's going to win. They just right. think that Georgia might not win by more than thirteen and a half points or twelve. Thirty-one and a half to twenty. Yeah. So uh, you know that's man, that's really interesting. I will. I'll still take Georgia. Yeah, I don't want to get off of that, but I will say I feel a lot worse about it. I'm going to take Georgia, and I think they're going to win 31 to 14. I, like I, I don't think it's going to be close. I really just don't. I, Georgia, they just have too much of, or too big of a chip on their shoulder. And I'll tell you what: if you are gambling, let me give you one pick in this game that's the best pick of the game: Georgia to cover six and a half points in the second half. Georgia is a, they were notorious for whatever reason last year, getting to a lot of slow starts, averaged less than a touchdown per game in the first quarter games a year ago, but they led the country in scoring offense in the second quarter games. And they were like seventh in the country in, in second half points per game. They were very, like, you've seen it a million times with, with, with Saban. Like, when, when you make halftime adjustments, which is when Georgia and that coaching staff are at their best, you know, that's when they kind of turn it on and they kind of, they kind of suffocate you after that. All right. Moving on I, to another game hang on, hang on Saturday. Real, real quick, real quick. Number one, I know I, I did a score prediction, which is 48-17, so that's 31. So, obviously, I'm taking Western Kentucky based off of that score prediction, yeah. which is very unfortunate. I did By a score point. prediction rather than uh, – yeah, I mean, this, and that's me kind of – I guess, you know, you know the spread, so you can kind of keep that in mind. It, I didn't design it that way. Uh, in fact, you know, I, I kind of want to pick Alabama to cover that, but, I mean, that's the score prediction I've said, and that's what I'm going to stick with. So, unfortunately – in week one, I'm going with Western Kentucky. Who did you say you officially went with? So in this very moment, I realized that I did not because I got so excited about all the numbers I, I was saying. Yeah. Um, so I will say. And, and we, we also need to read Mix, and I'll get both of his two on yeah. those two games once you, you tell us where you're at. Sure. So for, for the Bama game, I do worry a little bit like the second half and, and make, like maintaining the efficiency and then maybe the helmet comp thing just with a new staff in place and quarterback. So I'm going to say Bama wins. I think the secondary might be, you know, in in trouble at times just the way the western kentucky offense is i'm going to take bama 44 to 17 i would I, and i know we've already we're jumping back to it i, I just any time alabama has been in this situation where it's felt like they would want to get their number two quarterback yeah actual work not turn around and hand the football off but actually have him operate the offense and that you know if that that offense is scoring points you know and you know a lot of points um, you know, I, I always worry about that. You know, when you're trying to pick against the other team, I could totally see Alabama, uh, getting, you know, to covering the spread based off of Ty Simpson coming in and yeah. maybe scoring an extra touchdown, maybe even two. Uh, so that's, I, I will say, I know what my score prediction is. I know that that falls short of Western Kentucky or uh, Alabama covering against Western Kentucky, but I will say I wouldn't be shocked at all if they did. And they did fairly easily. Um, Fair. so Mick went. Georgia and he, he laid the points and then okay. he took Bama minus 31 and a half. So okay. that's uh you know good good for Mick. Uh going with those SEC guys and we'll we'll, we'll tell you all of his stuff. Obviously he's not here. This is you know I guess technically all tied up because it's me and Chris. It was supposed to be cover crimson with all three of us and it'll usually be all three of us doing these picks every week. But yeah. you know for now Mick's really busy he's doing that show over at uh his Bama Tailgate YouTube channel pregame show with jake coker should be a lot of fun could definitely go check that out but chris what's the next game on the list all right so let's go to i don't know why you included the stanford tcu game so we're going to save that for last when people stop watching um let's go to let's go to florida miami because I, I tell you what very excited to watch this game could not have a like have less of a feel on how to pick it or or how to um, approach it from a betting standpoint. I, I will say this. I'm very high on Miami. I think they're going to win the ACC. And I and I thought that even before last week with what happened with Florida State, I just think they have put so much of an investment, like a literal investment into the, the portal this year and bringing in all these new guys. Like, like I've said it to you before, it feels like a, a, a Major League Baseball team, like right before the, the, the trade deadline, trying to make a push for the postseason. Like that them and Ole Miss, that's exactly what them it feels like. They feel like their, their window is right now. So... I think that like they are going to be a really good team as long as Mario Cristobal can get out of his own way because they just have so much. They haven't. They you did you watch any of the ACC last night? 
NC so State, you, a dark horse for the conference, struggling with Western Carolina. I mean, I watched that game just for the simple purpose of all the hype that every, I, you know, I don't know just a ton about NC State. I know a lot of surface level stuff. And so, based off of what I knew, it didn't make sense that they were being picked to be, you know, a potential ACC winner, top four seed in the college football playoff. Uh, I just wasn't really seeing it. Looked into them a little bit before the game last night. But yeah, I watched it just for the simple fact of I want to see what everybody's talking about. And I will say I was highly disappointed. Yeah. Um, it just, it like, I think this is a very, very weak conference in general. And I think that only helps a team like Miami. They also, this doesn't really matter. They do get Florida State at home, but there's not really a home field advantage. In regards to this game, one, the funniest thing that could happen in college football this year and the most college football y thing that could happen in college football is if Florida goes five and seven, like a lot of people think they will, because that schedule's brutal, but they go three and oh in the state of Florida because they play Miami, Florida State, and UCF. That would be amazing. It's there's very a, possible. Very possible. There's a there's been a ton of talk about Napier being on the hot seat, which I think is there's people, I, I mean, I if you talk to people close to the program down at Florida, there's a lot of people that are in the camp of He's closer to a contract extension than he is being fired. And there's a lot of stuff going on with that university with like the president's in some hot water because he went way over budget, giving a bunch of jobs out to his friends. And the AD has been really, really bad there. Very rarely do you see a program and university have like, you know, those three jobs all open at once. I think Napier, the closer we've gotten to the season, it feels like he's got a quiet confidence about him. Graham Mertz is the most underrated and overlooked player in the country at any position like top five in the country or top five in the conference, like, like across the board statistically last year for quarterbacks led the conference in completion percentage had the fewest amount of interceptions thrown. I think that that home, like that home atmosphere is going to carry this game and this team at least into the fourth quarter. I think you will see some stupid things happen in this game. Like, like <laughs> whether it's a monsoon, whether it's like a butt fumble, like there will be something Florida man that happens in this game and I think it's going to be maybe the most entertaining game of the weekend. I mean, I, again, like I don't have a feel for it. I, I'm going to say Miami because I think there's too much of a late public push on Florida. The line is still Miami at two and a half. But I mean, Mario Cristobal as a head coach is like 18 and 17 on the road. Like he's just very, very average away from home. So I'm going to say Miami wins, but do not be surprised if Florida is able to somehow pull this out and, and like, that would be huge for Billy Napier. Uh, yeah, I, the, the hook bothers me. I really wish yeah. it would, you know, three, I'd feel really good about Florida. I really would. Uh, and, and, you know, two and a half, I think I still am going to take Florida. And the reason being is a lot of what you mentioned, I think having the advantage at quarterback as far as just experience and time in the system uh, with the program right. is going to help. I could totally see, you know, Cam Ward having to, you know, work some things out, some kinks. In the beginning, and the fact that you know it's in the swamp, that's absolutely huge, a big yeah. part of this. There will be a lot of Miami fans there too, but you know, uh, the swamp's a, a tough place to play. And it, it's that Miami, just from a bragging rights standpoint, like they will want to win this game, but I don't right. think they have to have it. No, like, they don't because you're not trying to make the ACC SEC comparison. Go win the ACC, and it doesn't matter. Uh, every all four power four conferences get an automatic bid exactly. They're in a really good uh, position to win the conference, so it's not like this is going to come down to well, you lost to a five and seven Florida or six and six Florida, you're going to be left out of the college football playoff. I mean, yeah. I even think if they lose one game, two games, uh, if if they're up, they, they will continue to be in that conversation, and maybe that that this game comes into the conversation at that point. But I don't really think they're looking at their schedule and believe they're going to leave uh, even lose two games. So it, this just feel and it, the fact that it's week one. Like you have such a long time for everybody to forget about this. Everybody yeah. will have the built-in excuse. You had a lot of transfers. Guys were working things out. This is a different team in November yeah. or late October than it was, you know, at, uh, at the uh, end of August. So I think that that's kind of built in as you know an excuse that really helps them. So I just don't think it's like a must-win for Miami. I think it is more of a must-win for Florida just yeah. on what they're trying to achieve this year. Uh, which is, you know, helping Billy Napier keep his job. So I'm going to say Florida and, and uh, you know, take the points. You know, the thing is, I, I, I'm going to, like, I'm going to sound kind of like a conspiracy theorist here, but just, like, hear me out. Like, in, in, in what we're going to see now in the playoff era, you're going to, you you have to start seeing the big picture of things. And, I, and I'll tell you who's, like, a very good example of that is Kirby, 
who over the past several years, like you would see how these, how mundane these offensive like offenses were and like early in the season, like they would struggle with teams like Kent state. I remember watching that Kent state game a couple years ago and they ran the same play three plays in a row until they got it right. It was like, a, it was like a live action scrimmage. And I'm not saying that's what Miami's going to, how they're going to approach this game by any means. But I do think in this day and age of the playoff and, and football, you also have to have the big picture in, like in mind of what are we going to put on tape? Because like we, we need to make sure that we like, like the, the things that's most important for us to advance, like you said, are those eight or nine games in the ACC. So um, I'm going to take Miami. I hate it, I, but I, I, I can't wait for that game. Um, All right. Uh, hang on. Uh, yeah. Nick took Florida plus two and a half. I feels like you guys are both right. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm actually, and I, I mean, anytime I'm this confident in something, I always end up being wrong, but I actually feel really good about Florida in two and a half. I, I would feel way better with three, but two and a half, um, I'll take that. All right, we'll rub it in. Thanks a lot. Um, all right, let's go to, I can't wait to talk long enough that we don't get to Florida State and Boston College because it doesn't matter. And I will, I just will never know why you decided to put TCU and Stanford on here. But A&M and Notre Dame, you want to talk about just, I, I mean, I don't like this matchup of unlikable fan bases. Um, and here's the thing, A&M seems like they are a great host to everyone that comes through College Station. I just, if I wanted to go to a, a giant, you know, all male sing along, I would go back to summer camp in fourth grade. So, like, I don't know how difficult of an atmosphere Kyle Field is. Everything I've heard says it's 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 pretty unreal. I will tell you this: all jokes aside, Notre Dame is about to go into the toughest and loudest and like in and, and craziest environment that any of them will will play in probably in their college careers, unless they get like a like a home you know, or like an away game in, in the playoff at like Penn State or Ohio State or something like that because they they do not have another team or or environment um, on that schedule that's that's remotely close to this. Now, here's the thing I think with Notre Dame. I am surprised this number opened at one this summer, which was shocking to me because Notre Dame is, is ranked seventh in country. I think they're going to be very good. I think they are a shoe in for the playoff. I think Riley Leonard's going to be good. I think they have a lot of talent like on the roster in general. They also went out and got the OC from LSU from last year who led the country in scoring and uh, yards per game. Obviously, Jaden Daniels won the Heisman, and now he gets to go do that with Riley Leonard. But the line has only gone up in A&M's favor. And, and you know the public perception of Notre Dame, especially from a, like a casual betting standpoint. So the money, like it's not like it's, it's been heavy on A&M the whole time. Like, like there's a lot of money coming in on Notre Dame still, but the line keeps going up in A&M's favor. A lot of sharps there. The thing that concerns me the most if you're Notre Dame, besides going into the actual environment, is they had to replace both offensive tackles from last year's team. One of them was Joe Alt. It was like a first-round draft pick. Then they go into this season, and they lose their starting left tackle. I, did, I think they might have lost both again. Or I know they at least lost one. And when you're going up against this this Texas A&M defensive line, you've got Nick Scorton from from the transfer from Purdue, who led the Big Ten in sacks a year ago. And and like we kind of crap on the Big Ten every now and then, but there are some good edge rushers, especially at Ohio State in that in that conference. Chop Robinson was in that conference from Penn State a year ago. This guy led the whole conference in sacks. You pair him with Shamar Turner. There's another one that I'm forgetting, but that D line is still Shamar Stewart. Yes. And that, that D-line is still very talented. And I will also say this. I think it's going to be a low-scoring game. I think that A&M is going to win in a very low-scoring game. I'm talking like 20 to 17 type thing. But Connor Wegman has all the tools, and I think he has the most underrated receiver in the conference in Moose Muhammad. So I'm going to take them to win in a very low-scoring, ugly defensive game. Yeah, so that's the problem that I'm having with Notre Dame right now. A, it's the environment, uh, Kyle Field. It's the defensive front they're going to be going against. It's yeah. Mike Elko and the and the way that he schemes things up, the way that he's going to attack you defensively. So you think they're going to be aggressive and be able to put Riley Leonard under some duress. And then you combine that with the fact that, you know, you talked about Notre Dame losing their left tackle. Uh, I, mean, I, I mean, I don't even know. It's I mean, the entire group's really young. I, I want to yeah. say they have like single digit starts, if I'm not mistaken. When I was going back and looking at this, uh, collectively amongst the entire group, that's insane. Uh, and so when you combine a young offensive line trying to communicate in Caulfield against a really good defensive front, 
against a, a, a defensive-minded head coach in Mike Elko that's going to be very aggressive in how he calls things um, or, or how they call things. I mean, I, I just I think that's a really bad combination for Notre Dame. So I'm really not shocked at all. I like Notre Dame too. I like them for the rest of their schedule. I actually don't think mm-hmm. that Texas A&M, they are a borderline top 25 team to me right now. Uh, but, you know, it, I'm kind of at a point where I don't see a situation really where Notre Dame gets a win here given those circumstances. So I, I think it's pretty easy. I'm going with A&M. And let's yeah, okay. see. I don't even see. Did Mick even pick this game? I don't think he did. No, he didn't. So I'm going to have to get his pick on that. But but who are you, are you going with A&M or are you going with Notre Dame? I'm going with a and Like, listen, I think the only way that Notre Dame wins this game, I, I think they have the talent to, and I still say they are going to make the playoff. I think they're going to be a really good team. I think dude, here's here's one thing, too, I will say against that, is as, as much hype as is surrounding Notre Dame and having that number seven ranking and all that kind of stuff. And I think Marcus Freeman's a good coach. Like, dude, you get the you get the OC that was at LSU a year ago, and then you also have Marcus Freeman who's a defensive-minded coach, and you have talent on that roster, like a lot of talent. But – Dude, we're two years removed from them losing at home to Marshall, and now we're expecting them to go on the road in in Kyle Field. Like, you know that that's a tall task. So, and 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 the last thing I'll say too is is Mike Elko not only has done well in, in at Duke, right, but the the time it took him to turn that program around. They go nine wins his first year. They had ten total wins combined in the three seasons prior to that. So, yeah, man, I got I got I got in to win. I think it's close, but I think they win. I, who do you feel better about, Texas A&M or Florida? Oh, A&M. Well, uh, so, well, I'll tell you what. If Florida pretty- was playing A&M's schedule or anyone else's schedule in the country, I would feel better about them. Well, I'm, I'm just- saying just from a, a, a this week, like the pick between A&M. Oh, you went with, did you go to Miami? Yeah. Oh, okay. Then never mind. I know. Exactly. I didn't feel a lot of confidence in that, though. Okay. So how do you, okay, let's, it's same spread pretty much yeah. who do you have more confidence in miami or texas a&m I, I mean i feel like a&m just because like it like it's well i don't really have a reason now that i think about it, it feels like it's the exact same situation <laughs> <That's a Spider-Man laughs> i was wondering i was like how's he uh what, what's gonna be the reason to hear um, i'm so passionate about the other one just uh, just contradicting myself the whole time but it, it is actually uh there, there are some similarities there but uh, yeah, yeah i like a&m a lot in this game actually i feel pretty good about that maybe i'd end up being wrong but uh, if this was in South Bend, I'd probably feel a lot differently, but it's just the combination of defense, yeah. poor offensive line, and, and uh, you know, environment. Agreed. Um, l- let's just get this out of the way real quick, okay? Actually, no, we'll just save it for last. I, you know, actually, screw it. We're going to spend no more than three minutes on this pick. We don't even have to. We can just make the pick. Okay, well, I mean, I, I, I did pull something up that I wanted to Okay, just... all right. Well, so, Mr. So we're not going to spend any more time than... Yeah. Okay. I mean, I did um, 36 hours of prep for this. So we're only going to spend three minutes. Like, we got, me and Allie were talking about it yesterday, and she was like, listen, I know that you're excited about the season, but don't sit here and start spending like all these... Don't be doing 4, 4 a.m. deep dives again like you did. I was like, why? why? I'm not going to do that this year. Dude. What time did you get to bed? First, I did not go to bed. So there's that. Okay, yep. um, <laughs> yeah. That is, it's not been a great day. I napped today, though. That was good. I just get so excited. It's the start of the year. Anyway, um, a lot of Celsius flowing through the veins right now. This game, Florida State and Boston College, don't care about it. I hate the fact that it's on Monday. It's a solo individual game to end the weekend. Usually we get a much better matchup at, at that, uh, that Monday night. If I'm trying to sell you on this game, I will tell you one thing. So Florida State has owned this series, right? One, two, three. They've won five in a row, and they've won – all but one since they've won 12 out of the last 13. But those last five in a row, four of the five have been by only seven points or less. Last year, you know, Boston College wasn't great. Florida State obviously was undefeated. They only won by two. Um, two years ago, they only won by three. Uh, won by seven uh, in, in 2019. They won by one in 2018 for whatever reason. Even in the even in the 2013 season, it was a, a situation where they struggled with Boston College for whatever reason. They do get them at home, which they haven't had as many issues with. But this is like a weird. I don't know why. It, like it's not a, like I'm not comparing it to this, but it's it's like 
it, it's like going to Starkville. That's what I would compare it to. Like, like something bad feels like it always happens. And like, you don't leave unscathed. That is such a weird comparison. I was going to say I, Auburn. That sounds stupid. So <laughs> well, I, Mississippi State wasn't much better, Chief. Um, yeah. But yeah, I will say um, I'm having a hard time. with it. The reason I picked it is because it's like, hey, someone might want to know what Clint and Chris think about the Monday night game. I'm planning on playing some money on this because it's the only game that day. So I thought, hey, we should just give them our opinion. We might uh, hate watching because of Bill O'Brien. Well, <laughs> well I, and that's that's an interesting storyline of this too but for me i don't know what to make of like okay florida state could have a uh built-in advantage considering they've already been able to knock off some rust mm-hmm. playing last week but it was in dublin and yeah. you know how much you know having to make that transition back to the u.s it was just a week ago uh you know they could still be dealing with some hangover from that this feels like a get right game for Florida state. Like yeah. I still think they're a really talented team and I could see them coming out and making a huge statement that, Hey, we, we played poorly. Um, but you know, we've been able to knock some kinks or wrinkles out a little bit, figure some things out. We exposed where we needed to work on, you know, can it get fixed in a week? But then I can also see just the negative perception around Florida state right now. We've seen teams like this in the past completely crumble. And yeah. just things get so much worse. And Dude, so that's what, Alabama. Uh yeah. Oh wow. That's actually a that's a very interesting comparison. Um and so I don't I just don't know what which Florida State are we gonna get. Is this a get right game or is this a well it's only gonna get worse? Yeah. So with that, um, you know, I I believe in the talent gap, but Boston College is normally pretty frisky. But that's normally like a home thing, you know, when they're at home, right. they're a lot more of that team. The fact that it's in Tallahassee is a little bit different. So I, I, I was, I've been going back and forth with this. I picked Florida state and I think I'm actually going to change. Okay. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the points. It's 16 and a half, right? I'm trying to find it right now. Cause I did. I don't think I looked it up. Um, sure. Let's say it is. Okay, 16 and a half. And uh, Mick is going Boston College plus 16 and a half, too. Okay, so here's what I'll say about this. All right. I, I, this, this whole thing, it's you, first off, you, with your second guessing yourself, you've made twice as many picks as I've made this, this time, um, during the episode because you have just gone back and forth on, on, on both. Um, wait, what? Never mind. So I, I was I was making a joke because of the fact that like you you've like gone back and forth with some of the picks and then I forgot to make my picks in the first like oh, two or three yeah, games. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Um, Just figure out a way I can pick both teams and that way I can kind of exactly. Be right. I never lose. So the thing with Florida State in this game that I that I like for them, one watching this game as like a Bama fan, this very much is going to feel like that 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 meme or gif of of the the woman drinking that like soda or coke and she's like, mm, mm, mm. yep, just like back and forth because. <laughs> I think everyone's. I feel like I'm pulling against Florida State just because the way they acted in the off season, but I'm also not going to root for Bill O'Brien ever. Um, so the thing that that I think is the the biggest benefit for Florida State in this game isn't even, you know, coming off the loss and 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 trying to like, you know get things right or whatever. What Georgia Tech did to Florida State was they bullied them. I mean, they they manhandled them up front on both sides of the ball, both sides of the ball, but especially on the offensive line. Haynes King only attempted 16 passes in that game. And you go into that, that the season hearing guys like Pete Thamel say like, Oh yeah, I talked to NFL scouts. They said, this is the best defensive line in the country. And they got whooped up front by Georgia tech. If there's one thing I know that Bill O'Brien's not going to do, it's stick to running the football, especially in situations that make sense to run the football. And I'm talking about 2021 A&M and I'm talking about 2022 Tennessee. That being said, I think it's a good matchup because of that. And I'm not even being petty. I think it, it it makes sense. It's a good matchup for Florida State because of that. So I will take them to win big. Okay. Okay. I can see it. Yeah. I, I mean, it, like I said, if they're, if their mind's right and they're ready to right some wrongs, they'll smoke them. Yeah. I just, uh, I don't know. Pardon me. It, DJU, man, that, <sighs> it, that, that cat's concerning, uh, real concerning. So Listen, he hopefully he gets it right. More years. If he, if he gets a couple more years in college, I think he's going to turn it around. I'd say we just give him the the Tom Brady treatment in college. Let him, let him play in college until he's 40, yeah. uh, 40 plus, 42. And I think 
those last couple of years could be pretty good for him. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I'm going to let you take the lead on this because I've been talking way too much. What is happening here? Uh, TCU minus nine last time I checked. And, mm-hmm. I mean, I was just curious. I mean, obviously, TCU is going to be a pretty fun offense. Kendall Brawls, offensive coordinator. There's a bunch of former Alabama players. JoJo mm-hmm. Earl is going to be involved in that wide receiver room. I, mean, I think so. uh, James Brockermeyer is listed as a co-starter, and he's listed first at center. Um, so that's Where good. Tommy? Uh, he, he had to retire from football for oh. medical reasons. So yeah, yeah he's, he's not up there. I've, Trey Sanders is their mm-hmm. number two running back. He got that sixth year of eligibility. Um, good for him, man. Yeah. And, and, you know, he'll be a part of that offense. Obviously, Cam Cook, he's really explosive. He's our starter. Yeah. No, so I don't know. You know, Trey, uh, Trey Sanders will get work, though, especially down there into the goal line. Josh Hoover, really unique skill set, man. Uh, I mean, I want to say, like, in five of their last six games last year, he topped 300 yards passing. And just in that Kendall Browse offense. Yeah. Stanford, uh, I don't, I really don't know what to make of them. They're kind of like, and they're not like Clemson to this degree, but like the the returning offensive line experience, all five starters back on the offensive line, like eight or nine guys with experience there, but they just weren't good in 2023. No. So it's a matter of, okay, the fact that they're all back, the continuity, how much do they improve? How much does that matter for Stanford? Uh, TCU, I think, is going to be really tough to keep up with offensively, though. Yeah. And so that's, I'm going to, you know, go ahead and, and lay the points and I'm going to say TCU minus nine. And Mick is on board with me. So, uh, yeah, I am too. Stanford, Stanford had the, the 132nd ranked scoring defense a year ago, giving up 38 points per game. That is unreal. 38 <laughs> points per game. Um, and here's the other thing the only thing I know about Stanford is that, they lost their best two offensive weapons because um, the receiver they had that put up like 300 yards in that crazy comeback game against against uh, Colorado, he's gone. He went to the league and got drafted in like the fifth round or something. And then the tight end, Ben Urasek, I think he's going to have a really good year for Georgia because I love Oscar Delp. I think he is, he's going to be a really, really good football player for them especially in an offense that, that utilizes tight ends like them. But, dude, I, I didn't know this until the other day. Ben Yurisek, the, the, the tight end from Sanford that now is at Georgia, in, since 2021, he the only, the only tight ends that have more receiving yards than him were Brock Bowers, Michael Mayer, and Dalton Kincaid. And all three of those guys got drafted in the first 35 picks of the NFL draft. Two of them were first-rounders. So that's a lot of production that's just gone. And it's not really an offense that was ever really potent. So I think TCU in a year where they kind of like have a get back year, they can kind of retool and regroup. And I know they've, they've been in the portal and like, you know, like they, they caught lightning in a bottle two years ago, got to the national championship last year was like a more humbling experience. I think Sonny Dykes is a good coach though. And, and yeah, I, I, think I think they'll too. run away with this, one. this is not a tough place to play. It, yeah, no, it, it just, uh, I, I don't know. It, it's a bigger, you know, Stanford, has some name, you know, quite a bit of name recognition. TCU has been pretty yeah. good in recent years, and I was looking to get to an eighth game. So, well, see, it's a classic Big 12 ACC matchup. Been playing it for years. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's <laughs> let's get to the final game. Um, and I should have said it's not a tough place to play. It is close to Oakland, which seems like a war zone right now. So there's that. <laughs> um, let's get to LSU and Southern Cal. All of my coworkers from ESPN 104.5 over there in Baton Rouge are out in Vegas. Um, oh, you and, got left and, at home, huh? What's that? You got left at home, huh? Yeah. I tell you what, like starting this job at this time, I, I did kind of have my fingers crossed that I was going to get to go to either Vegas or the Super Bowl since it's in New Orleans or both. But I also am not going to pretend to be an LSU or Saints fan, so I think that's really kind of hurt my chances. So um, <laughs> this this game, another game that's been very interesting with the way the Vegas line has moved. This opened at six in the summer. It has dropped down all the way down to four. Um, it's gone back up to four and a half, then back down to four. Southern Cal, it, like it, like if you talk to anybody close to LSU, they are very aware of the fact that this is a this like you're looking in a mirror in this game, right? Like yes. both replacing Heisman Heisman Trophy quarterbacks, um, literally went one and two in the draft. Also, going into a new year where the previous season you had like LSU legitimately had the worst defense in program history statistically, and 
USC was really bad. They were so bad. I did not understand how DC had, had that job for that long, but both coaches, both head coaches make necessary changes. I, you really have to tip your cap to Brian Kelly because not enough. I feel like it was made of this off season of, of what he did to fix Blake that. Baker. Defense body. It wasn't just going to get Blake Baker at DC. It was going to get Bo Davis, a defensive line coach, Corey Raymond as defensive backs coach, five total new assistant coaches on that side of the ball. They're still not going to be great up front or, or in the secondary. They're still really young. And I think USC will, will, will have several opportunities. Well, they probably will, you know, have some chunk plays, maybe expose like the secondary and, and have some like confusion back there. But here's the thing I think that changed my entire mindset on this. Cause for a second, I was starting to get like a convinced myself. I was like, you know what, man, USC, the, the line's moving for a reason. Cause there's no reason for anyone to be betting on USC over LSU. Like, you, like, Lincoln Riley, and not just because of his brisket, has become kind of like a laughing stock in the butt of a lot of jokes in college football with how much he's underachieved since he's gone to L.A. But if there's one thing he is good at, it's replacing elite Heisman level and and, and number one overall draft pick level quarterbacks. I think Miller Moss is going to be good. But on Wednesday at whatever press conference that they were doing with like post-practice or whatever, offensive lineman Will Campbell, best offensive tackle in the country, LSU arguably has the best offensive line possibly in the country. They have they have two first round draft picks at the tackle positions. Will Campbell's quote about going out to Vegas was this: "We're not there to go to Caesar's uh, Caesar's Palace. We're going out there to get into a fist fight." And him, Emory Jones, Caleb Jackson, Caleb Jackson is going to hurt somebody this year. He is a <laughs> he is a physical physical back. I think that this LSU team we, we're so used to them over the last five years throwing the football over the yard. I think that they are going to pound the football and try to pound Southern Cal into submission because I I tell you what, man, talking to anybody close to that program, they are real fed up with the fact that they have lost four straight season openers. Four straight. Yep. KJ Costello beat them. (laughs) Oh yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, man. Uh, This game to me, it comes down to which, really bad defense yeah. and improve enough to make the new starting quarterback uncomfortable enough to win the game. Right. And I don't really say I have a whole lot of confidence in either, but Blake Baker, a very aggressive style, did a lot of really good things for Missouri. Mm-hmm. The fact that you've, you know, kind of, um, you've got the offensive line that you can fall back on. And I would, I think it's going to be a pretty good run game. Yeah. I think that LSU can do more to, you know, mask any sort of problems that Garrett Nussmeyer might have in this type of game. Now, here's the thing though. Nussmeyer is a very gunslinger mentality, you know, type of quarterback. Uh, can USC capitalize on yeah. some of that? Maybe get some turnovers. Cause I do think it's going to be, both offenses having quite a bit of success, and in that type of game, uh, you know that those one or two turnovers can make all the difference. Uh, yeah. you know it's one or two stops is putting your offense in really good you know scoring position. They take advantage. They can create separation. Uh, you know if you can stack you know drives as far as like the end of the second half or excuse me end of the first half, beginning of the second half. You know you can create. That's really your only opportunity to create separations in games like this, unless you're getting those you know one or two key stops, and it's normally by way of turnovers and just yeah. yeah, one of the offenses making a mistake. And that's my, even though, you know, I think he can sling the football around. He also can turn the football over. I think seven interceptions in his limited time as Very a, limited, uh, yeah. you know, so at the same time, I just trust what LSU is going to, and maybe that's just a, a bias sec thing that, that really shouldn't be there, but I just, I think they're going to get right enough defensively mm-hmm. to be a better defense than USC is going to bring to the table. So considering I view the offense as fairly similar, like they both got elite receivers, you know, run games, you know, uh, Woody, uh, uh, like Woody March, the the running back from Mississippi State. I think he's going to end up being a pretty good player for them. They got a couple of running backs, but just to me, the difference is the defense and just getting, you know, one or two key stops. And if the question question mark is on defense, possibly the best defensive player in the country is is suited up for LSU. So I'll be very curious to see how they use him this year. They though. better. <laughs> it's, just, it's just the unbelievable. Uh, like the way they tried to use him a year ago, was just one of the weirdest and dumbest things I've seen in quite some time. Um, 
Uh, anyway, so yeah, it, it's like if you try to make Shohei hit right-handed, I just don't know why you would do that. So <laughs> I, I I do agree with you. I, I'm going to take LSU to win. I think I, I put this in my best bets, and I'll I'll run through them real quick. I know we've we've been on here for about an hour, but I do have some picks that I think are are, are good. I, I'm going to take LSU money line here from a from a safe bet standpoint because the number is kind of all over the place. I could easily see USC keeping this thing close, and I honestly I think they could have a lead early on in this game, and this is something where LSU is going to have to like slowly like you know like i don't know how to phrase this because i was gonna say grind from behind that sounds bad so like <laughs> come from behind to win you know what i'm trying to say like, no, no. The, like ground it out on the, like on the ground um so i like lsu money line I'll, I'll give you a couple more that that i like tonight uh wisconsin is playing we're filming this on friday wisconsin's playing western michigan and bama gets them in a couple weeks and i know everyone is a little bit nervous about going up to camp randall but madison's not gonna be an easy trip one thing that I think we haven't talked enough about, we probably will when it's game week, but Tyler Van Dyke is now the quarterback up there. His OC is Phil Longo, and Phil Longo is a nut job. He used to DM me at SCS all the time because he thought I was a former player of his for some reason. So I was basically just catfishing Phil Longo for like three or four years on SCS Twitter. He is a good offensive mind, um, as crazy as he might be on social media. He's done really well, obviously, at UNC with the quarterbacks he developed there. Sam Howell, Drake May, uh, you know, the offense he had at Ole Miss with Jordan Ta'omu. Um, I think he's going to do well with with uh, Tyler Van Dyke. And the the prop for his touchdowns in, in tonight's game is, is one and a half. So I like that. Um, the only other ones I'll say, I kind of like Nebraska to cover against a bad UTEP team. 27 and a half. I think there's a lot right on that. And I'll tell you one more. Syracuse is like a 16 and a half point favorite. They, they got a ton of talent in the portal. They're playing a really bad Ohio team, and I believe um, it's an Ohio team that has get, gotten beaten by an average of like 23 points per game when they've played power for uh, competition. So those are some other ones I like. I think there's one more, but I'm, I'm forgetting it. Does, oh, Tennessee to score first on their first possession. A lot of hype coming into the season, but Josh Heupel going into last year, uh, Tennessee scored first in 27 of his 32 games as a head coach in Knoxville. I expect them to get off to a good start against UT Chattanooga as well. Okay, is that score first between the two teams or score on first drive? Score on first drive. Okay, okay. Yeah, I was looking. Okay, that makes more sense. I was about to say, of course, that would be an easy bet. Okay, um, so I don't know. Did I reveal what Nick wanted on that? Yeah, he had LSU minus four. So, okay, that's that's that. All right, man. Well, what I want people to do right now is go subscribe to CoverCrimson.com. Yes. We're going to be putting our picks up. I'll probably have to go back and actually listen to mine because, you know, I've got back and forth so much on some of these that I don't remember what I said. Um, but I'll track. I'll, I'll put everybody's in there before tomorrow morning. Yeah. Um, and then I will. Uh, I want anybody that's subscribed to go make the picks on the same games. We're going to be tracking it. Whoever ends up doing the best this year. They're going to have a prize at the end of the season. So you're definitely going to want to be a part of that. And this isn't something like comment in the YouTube uh, comments. I mean, you can if you want to, but it's not going to count. You can't do it on Twitter. It has to be on the CoverCrimson.com message board because that's where I'm going to be tracking it. And, you know, uh, like I said, I, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I, I'm excited about this. Mick's going to be back with us next week. And, and I think he's going to bring a little bit of a different vibe. I was a lot more analytical with this than I thought I would be as far as like, yeah, you were, well, just got that, look at you had graphics, bro. Uh, I don't know what you're, you know, jumping me for. Um, I wasn't, I was just, I, I thought it was great. Don't expect this every week for me. I'll get tired at some point. You were tired today. We're supposed to go <laughs> an hour earlier. You said, Clint, <laughs> I need a nap. And I, I did. Just being just an incredible person that I am was like, yeah. you know what, brother? I understand. Go, go. Catch it was very nice. Of you. I do appreciate it. Yeah. Go catch some Z's and we'll get this later. Uh, we'll get yeah, this brother. bread later. And that's exactly hey, uh, I'm getting all my picks right. And you're getting all the ones that are different than mine wrong. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> it, it is going to be fun. We appreciate everybody who listened with this. This might not be everybody's cup of tea. We totally understand that, but we do want to do this every week. We think it can be fun. It might not always last an hour. You know, it could be, you know, 30, 45 minutes, but just, you know, the fact there were so many intriguing games, yeah. kind of diving in a little bit, I thought it was fun. But uh, well, yeah. Real quick, on, I just want to say one thing to the audience because I listen, if, if this wasn't something that you enjoyed or, or we didn't talk enough about something that you specifically, you personally wanted to hear, the best way to go about that is to, in all caps, 
write in the comment section on YouTube and tell us how bad of a job we did because that is what sparks change. Thank you for that, Chris. Uh, uh, very much appreciate. You know what? Start to hear about these damn it, bagel bites. Start, start hearing about. Do put Chris in all caps first before you yeah. start anything. <laughs> and just if you want to, I would be very much appreciate if you were like Clint was absolutely lovely on this yeah. episode. Chris was a major problem. Uh, but well, yeah, this, this is first. So if you wait until after that, that'd be great. We could have gotten this under an hour, but now you're prolonging everything. So <laughs> we appreciate everybody tuning in. Like I said, go subscribe at CoverCrimson.com. Like this video, share this video, and if you do comment, uh, please be positive. Uh, now, granted, if we're wrong, roast us all you want yeah. to as far as like a pick or something, because I guarantee you, uh, probably going to be wrong on these. Chris, as always, I appreciate you, brother, and we will be back next week. Uh, you and I will be doing the Monday mail ba mailbag on Monday, obviously, and then Tuesday, we're going to be doing a stock report, stock up, stock down with players from this Western Kentucky game, and uh, that'll be fun, so... If yep. you're a fan of All Tied Up, you're going to get two episodes in the first two days of next week. I can't wait, and we will talk to you guys soon.